How's it going guys, I'm Theojo, and as you may know, iOS 13 was recently released by Apple, and actually just a few days after it, iOS 13.1. So we've got a lot of new features we can talk about. Some of these are pretty big, you may have already heard of them, and a couple of them are also pretty small, but still significant, and may even be a little bit hidden. So I think you'll enjoy this video, let's get into this. Now the first one, you probably already know about this one, is dark mode. Before, there was some workarounds to like invert the colors to get a pseudo dark mode, but now it's a real native dark mode that applies to the whole system and you can get to it by going to the display and brightness settings and then it's right there so you can have it on all the time you can set it to only be on dark mode from sunset to sunrise or you can create a custom schedule I personally like to just keep it on all the time I think considering the iPhone I have the 11 Pro has an OLED screen that the dark mode could potentially improve the battery life so I just keep it on all the time now one of the other really major features is called sign in with Apple so this will allow apps if the developer supports it in the app to allow you to sign into an app with your Apple account your Apple ID so this way you don't have to like type in your email address and like create a password it's so annoying whatever remembering them all even with a password manager potentially now you can literally just sign into some apps if they support it probably will be more over time using Apple ID and there's a few privacy and security features that go along with this including the ability to hide my email is one option which basically lets you create a unique email address just for that sign in so the app creator will not actually see your real email so they can't spam you or if they do start spamming you you can just disable that email address so basically only that app will use that specific email address and then it will forward to your main email address that you use personally so again it'll just let you keep more control over your private information if you don't want to be giving out your email address and getting on spam lists and that sort of thing I think it's really awesome alright so up next another feature that is pretty significant is the review revamped reminders app so before the reminders app it worked but it's pretty basic but now they've added several different features for example you can create categories of reminders and you can call these lists so you can have maybe I don't know daily reminders or that are repeating or maybe you can have I don't know really important ones in one list that sort of thing so you can create a list you can change the name of it you can change the color and the icon that sort of thing so it's a lot easier to use also for each individual reminder you can do things like flag the reminder if it's really important or actually set the priority so depending on the priority it'll have like exclamation parts points next to it and you can actually even share reminder lists with other people so if your spouse or your kids or whatever are all using Apple devices you can create like a family reminders list and then have your own priority set in there so other people will know all right this one's really important this one's not so important and then they'll see when someone else checks off a reminder so you can keep in sync so I think that's really cool so if you weren't really a big user of reminders in the past it might be something to take a look at again because they really did add a lot of features with it all right now into the photos app now they changed a lot in the photos app but I think what is the most significant thing here is they basically made it into a full-blown editing app so you can customize your and edit your photos a lot more than you could before so for example if you go to edit a photo you'll see some filters and options such as noise reduction so if it's like a night shot and it's really noisy you can potentially improve that you can add vignettes you can do things like sharpen adjust the white balance so these are a lot of features that you typically see in plenty of other photo editing apps and even in Instagram but were not available in the photos app in iOS but now they are and also very importantly is a lot of these adjustments can also now be done on videos so you can do things like cropping the videos you can apply filters directly to the video in the photos app you can even adjust the exposure and do other adjustments so again this was something that before you would have to use a separate app with it but now you can adjust your videos just as is you don't have to go and export it from another app it's not a pain all right moving on here's a significant feature that I think some people are gonna love and that is if you're using dual sim cards meaning you have a physical sim and then they also support the eSIM you now can use iMessage on both dual sim cards so before only the primary number could use iMessage and the other ones would always be sent as a SMS so you couldn't use FaceTime with it either but now if you do have dual sim both numbers can both use iMessage 
and FaceTime, which is awesome. That's something that was a big deal for me last time, and I was hoping they would implement it eventually, and they did. So this is just another reason why I think dual SIM is awesome. So you can, instead of having two separate phones, like a work phone, a personal phone, you can now just put both the SIM cards into one and you're good. All right, up next, this one's really cool and it is Bluetooth mouse support. Yes, iOS and iPad OS finally support mouses. Now this can be enabled by going to the accessibility settings, then touch, assistive touch, and I think you have to enable that, and then going down to devices, and then you can add Bluetooth device. Now, one thing I read is I believe you have to use a Bluetooth mouse that does not have a dongle. So a lot of times you'll buy a Bluetooth mouse and there's like a USB dongle. I think it have to, has to have Bluetooth built in directly into the mouse, not one that connects via dongle, which makes sense. Obviously, otherwise you'd be like using an annoying adapter into the phone, but I think there are obviously mouses that do have that. Now, I'm not totally sure how well this is gonna work compared to like a mouse on a computer because it is kind of hidden away in the accessibility settings. So I'm not sure if this is more supposed to be just kind of like a workaround for people who really can't use the screen normally, they have to use a mouse, or if it's for people who might be using an iPad, they actually want to edit photos on it like they would on a computer. But still the fact that it is available and there are some settings like sensitivity and uh, scroll speed, that sort of thing, then it's better than nothing. Now, speaking of Bluetooth mice, you can now actually also connect PS4 controllers and Xbox One controllers to play and control your iPad. I guess not just for games, but probably for other uses too. And this doesn't just work on iPhone and iPad, actually it will also work on the TV OS, so with your Apple TV, so that's really awesome. I think that's where a lot of people might use it even more so, because obviously, you know, it's meant to be a controller. If you're using it on TV, that's where you more use controllers. So that's pretty awesome. The one thing I will point out is if you're gonna use Xbox One controller, it has to be one of the newer ones that supports Bluetooth. Not all of the old ones do, so just know that. All right, here's a cool new feature, and that is the ability to silence unknown callers. So this can be found in the settings, then phone, and then just silence unknown callers. It apparently uses so-called Siri intelligence to determine whether or not you will be interested in this call and whether or not you know this phone number. So it's a little bit beyond just looking at whether the number is in your contacts list or not. It's also gonna do things like look in your received mail messages or iMessages, and if the number shows up somewhere in there, then it might be able to detect that potentially that's who the person is calling. So then it'll allow that number through because obviously, you know, if you were talking about a certain phone number before, then it makes sense that you will be receiving a call from it. But if it doesn't show up anywhere, then what happens is it will just not block the call, but it will send it to voicemail directly and it won't ring the phone. So it kind of blocks it, but you will see that the person called. All right, so the next new feature in iOS 13 is called Quick Path. It's a keyboard feature, which is basically swipe to type. So this has been a lot of other keyboards and a lot of other phones like Android, where you can just swipe between the letters and then it would determine what word it thinks you're trying to type. That is now built in. You don't have to enable it in the settings or anything. It comes right out of the box. However, if you want, you can actually disable it. So you can find the setting for it. If for some reason it's not working, you can go to settings, then general, keyboard and then just disable slide to type if you want to but i tested it out i really don't use swipe type ever but when i was testing it out it seemed to be really good at determining what word i wanted to type in even though i probably was not being super accurate so it seems to work pretty well at least all right up next here's a really cool feature that is not something you'll probably ever notice unless you lose your phone so basically how find my iphone worked before and still does technically is if you lose your iphone you mark it as lost and then if that phone is connected to cellular or something like that it will attempt to uh, send a signal to the GPS and then if it can connect to you know Apple servers then obviously it will tell you where it is but if the phone was offline like it wasn't connected to Wi-Fi or there's no signal or something like that you can actually now crowdsource this is all automatic Apple will crowdsource where your phone is so say your phone is lost, it's in a basement, there's no signal. What will happen is any other Apple devices nearby that are connected to the internet, or maybe they even mark them for later, but it will spot the Bluetooth signal from the lost phone and kind of, I guess, send it to Apple servers and then let someone, let you know 
that, hey, your phone was spotted here by another Apple device. So now your phone could potentially be found by any other person walking by that has a connected Apple device. And this is all encrypted. So it's not like the person using the phone is gonna get a notification, hey, you're nearby a lost Apple device. And then they you know, steal it themselves or something ridiculous like that. It doesn't work like that. It's all secure. And the person who detected the phone might not even know that happened. So I think this is really cool. It'll make it a lot more likely that lost iPhones may be found. And funny enough, maybe if someone steals an iPhone, then uh, their own phone, if they have an iPhone themselves, will rat them out and then let Apple know where the phone is so it can be found. All right, so now we've got some other features which may be a little bit smaller, a little bit hidden away. So the first one is you can now take a full page screenshot in Safari. So all you have to do is it's pretty built in. When you take a screenshot in Safari, it'll now give you a toggle between just screen like normal or full page. And then you'll see it gets really long and now you can take a screenshot on the entire page if you want. And also when you take a screenshot, you'll have the option to not just save it to photos, but also to files. So for example, if you wanna save it to, I don't know, Dropbox or some other app or something like that, you can do that. So it doesn't just go in your iPhone iCloud storage. The next feature is called optimized battery charging. This can be found in the settings and then battery and then battery health. And what happens with this is basically the iPhone will detect your routine, your typical routine for how you charge your phone. So say you always charge it once a day at night when you're sleeping, what it will do is not charge your phone 100% immediately, it will basically put it up to 80% and then wait so it can be timed to reach 100% when you usually start using your phone again. So say you wake up at 6 a.m., you go to bed at 10 p.m., then your phone will charge all the way to 80%, and then maybe if it knows that it takes an hour to get that last 20% in, it'll start charging again from 80 to 100 at 5 a.m. So theoretically, you can save more battery life if, if it's not at full charge as long. Now, obviously how well this works might depend on what kind of routine you have. If you wake up the exact same time every day, it might be good, but if you are someone who has a changing schedule all the time, then you might wake up and you have a half battery, who knows, or 80% battery rather, then I don't know, you can test it out yourself, see if it works. Okay, here's another cool little feature. You can now download app updates of any size over cellular. So before there was a limit of 200 megabytes for big app downloads, but now in the days of unlimited data, that's not really a problem anymore. So you can actually enable it. So you can either always ask if the app is over 200 megabytes if you wanna still download it or just always do it. And you can get to this by going to the settings, iTunes and App Store, and then app downloads. And then here you'll see those options for whether you wanna do it or not. For me, I'll probably just keep it on always ask, especially if it's a situation where maybe I have unlimited data, but the connection is really slow. I know it'll take forever to download anyway. Maybe I'll just put it off. All right, now the final new little feature is if you go to delete an app on your phone that has an active subscription that you're paying for, it will actually now warn you that deleting the app alone is not going to cancel the subscription. So I think this is an issue a lot of people have where you know they want to delete an app, they might forget about a subscription and then they're paying for something that they're literally not even using anymore. So this will kind of remind you and it'll just pop up a little thing explaining that and then tell you how to go into the subscription settings and disable it if you want. So those are just some really cool features that you may not have known about that are brand new. Let us know down in the comments which one is your favorite or if I missed any really major ones. I don't think I did, but who knows. Now, if you want to keep watching, I made a video recently where I built a home server rack. It was super cool. I'll put that link right here. You can just click on it and then it'll take you there. So definitely recommend checking out that video next. So thanks so much for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video.